book of Acts chapter 1, where we're at, Acts chapter 1, and give a quick review of where um, we ended and what we were talking about. Uh, if you have your Bible, let's open it up there. Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 5, 6, 7, and 8, and we'll see how much we get through this, okay? Acts chapter 1, verse 5, 6, 7, and 8, it says, um, <clears throat> For John truly baptized with water, uh, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? He said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. When he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they uh, unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Lord, bless again your word. Thank you for it. I pray that you give me wisdom to be able to explain, expound, and express some of the thoughts that we find in this passage. And then, Lord, you lead your spirit and would have free will, free reign amongst us. In Jesus' name, amen. So, this uh, uh, Acts chapter 1, we've gotten through uh, just the introduction, uh, the resurrection, unfallible, infallible proofs, and and then it mentions this baptism of the Holy Ghost. And that's what we talked about the last time I was up here to try to distinguish the word baptism just means to be immersed. It just means to be dunked in. So you could be like Scrooge McDuck dunked in money. Amen. I remember when I was a cartoon. I was a kid. They'd swim in the, in the, in the coins. You could be uh, a donut be dunked in, uh, baptized in coffee. Uh, you could be uh, Brother Dave McCracken, he used to preach a message about blackberry cobbler. I'll never forget it. And he said, I just want to dive in it and swim in a big thing of blackberry cobbler. I don't know why that's in my mind, but he would preach about <laughs> blackberry cobbler. And uh, you could be baptized in anything. just means to be immersed. When we have a, a physical baptism, we have water, and uh, we immerse the person in water. It pictures a burial and it pictures a, a new life that they're living now and a committed life. Um, but they're just immersed with, they're baptized with water. This Acts chapter 1 is talking about a moment where people, where people will have been baptized with the Holy Ghost. And that event happens in Acts chapter 2. I believe it also happens in Acts chapter 10. And uh, we'll get into those uh, as we go through the chapters. But it just means that wherever they were at, the room filled with the Holy Ghost and it, it came upon all of them. We talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit. There is a difference with that. Being filled with the Holy Spirit, I think, is an experience that all of us should have and could have on a, on a routinely basis. To be filled with the Holy Ghost literally means for Him to have full reign and occupy uh, inside of us, and I'll show that to you. But the reason why I'm making a big deal is this baptism with the Holy Ghost, I believe it happened, and now it's, it, it was fulfilled. Jesus said, wait for it, and it happened. He didn't tell us to wait for a baptism of the Holy Ghost. In fact, in Ephesians, it tells us there's just one faith, one Lord, one baptism. And so that can be confusing at times. And I'm not uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, distance and, and make dissonance with other, other church families. But you know what? I, I sure won't hesitate from what we teach as doctrine in the Bible here. Amen? Well, when I have some unity and want to be able to explain and study out 
what and why we, we get what we get. And so if you were asking the Baptist church, do you believe in a second blessing or a baptism of the Holy Ghost? I'll say, no, I believe in the filling of the Holy Ghost and you can be refilled and refilled and refilled. Let me show you how you get filled with the Holy Spirit. Go with me to Ephesians chapter number, uh, chapter number one. Ephesians one. Let's walk through a few pages of Ephesians. Ephesians 1, verse 13. This is how you get him inside of you. Because they had him outside of them. They were baptized with the Holy Ghost. And who did that? The Lord Jesus. John said, I baptize you with water. There's one among you who's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And he was talking about Jesus. And Jesus told these disciples, wait till this happens when it comes upon you. And then there'll be power along with it. Ephesians chapter 1, look at verse 13. Ephesians 1, 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of His glory. So when you believe, that's when you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. He comes in, He stays in. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Just turn the page, couple pages with me. Ephesians 4 verse 30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed of the day of redemption. So he doesn't come and go. This baptism of the Holy Ghost, it was an event and it didn't continually happen. You follow me? When they got baptized of the Holy Ghost and there were manifestation of languages they couldn't speak, that people said, Who, what's going on and what is this? That didn't happen continually. Paul, uh, Peter didn't go around and speak with other languages every day. That was an event and it happened when you have the Holy Spirit in you, you're sealed until the day of... That's a continual presence, not a point of power. Make sense? So now look at Ephesians 5, verse number, um, oh, verse number 18. The Bible says... And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with, what's it say? Spirit. Spirit. So, just, just a, 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 a parallel. Uh, if someone is drunk with wine, they are controlled by another substance. We'd say they lost their sobriety, they've lost their control. And so if you said, hey, this guy's drunk, then you're like, whoa, he is acting differently than he normally would. Amen? So the Bible says, Be not drunk with wine wherein even itself is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And so it's the same way that a guy would be controlled and would act differently than he would naturally if the Holy Spirit is filled him. Does that make sense? So in other words, I, I'm, a, I'm a proud man trying to be humble. I'm a, I'm a carnal man trying to be spiritual. How do, how do I become a spiritual person? By letting the Holy Spirit control me, and that would be synonymous with being filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, how do you do that? Because preacher, I want to be a spiritual person. Let me show you. In Ephesians 5, 18, watch what it says. Be filled with the Spirit. Look at the next two, two verses. Speaking to yourselves... In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So something's going on the inside. Now you say, preacher, I'm not a good singer. I know you're not. I'm glad that you're singing to yourself. Amen. Uh, that's okay. This says speaking to yourselves. You don't have to be a, a good singer. You don't have to be, uh, have a CD or a, or a record label. It says speaking to yourselves psalms 
That's scripture, isn't it? Psalms, there's a whole book of it, 150 of them. Hymns, those are traditionally songs about him. That's why we call them hymns. It's something that is uh, orchestrated about him. And there are plenty of other songs, and, and there, there's a, a host of songs. But when we say, I want to sing a hymn, where it's, oh, victory in... Yeah, it's about him. And, and, and it's something, uh, hopefully, that have some scriptural background and basis. Then it says, and spiritual songs. Again, songs that would have um, something uh, not carnal or not fleshly, but spiritual message. And it says, making melody in your heart to the Lord. So there's a song inside. When you sing... There's, there's some emotion with it. There's some heart. There's some connection. I don't know what they were singing in Hebrew at the Western Wall, but there was a lot of them singing it. And I'm pretty sure it was scripture. And uh, oh, just a, a, a chorus and a, and a, a parade of different um, uh, positions of the song. And, and boy, it was just a lot of going on at the Western Wall. They, they are putting those scriptures to song. I think David would be their uh, uh, foundation and their, uh, uh, their um, reasoning uh, for doing that. Even, even Moses, when, when they won the battle, there was a song of Moses. They sung after they went to the Red Sea. Interesting that, that songs are made over um, important events. Uh, the, the, what, the country singer that, that passed away recently, and he wrote the, the song after 9-11, and uh, a patriotic song. We sing, we sing uh, the Star Spangled Banner. That was kind of during a battle, wasn't it? Uh, written by uh, uh, Scott, uh, Fra- uh, Fra- Francis Scott Key. Yep, uh, thank you for my history lesson, for reminding me. <laughs> but, but the ramparts, ramparts red glare, the bombs bursting in air. It's written with, with an event in mind that they, that they, that they sung about. So it, this event, that being filled with, with melody about psalms and hymns, then look at the submission, verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, a spiritual mindset is a submissive mindset. To be controlled by something means you submit to it. If a man gets drunk, he has taken in intoxication. He submitted to let that enter his body. So for a spiritual parallel, you're saying, I'm submitting, Lord, I want to do what you have for me to do. Well, where do you find... Besides just these songs and these examples, where do you find what God wants you to do? Go to Colossians chapter 3 now. And this is the difference between being filled with the Spirit, which I think, since He's with us to the day of redemption, ought to be a continual thing, as opposed to the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which was a, a point of time that it took place. Colossians chapter 3. Look at verse 16, and let's start in the the middle of the verse. Because Ephesians 5 said, Speaking to yourself, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, and that that came after being filled with the Spirit. Colossians 3, in the middle of the verse, it says, Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace, where at? In your hearts to the Lord. Look at the next verse. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Now look at the beginning of verse 16. What's different? Verse 16 starts with this. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. I'm suggesting the way that you're filled with the Spirit is to be filled with the Bible. Filled with God's word. That can happen continually. That can happen uh, 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 just consistently to be con- try to be controlled by this book. So uh, 
I, I uh, got to be at a, a Jewish home on Friday evening, 6 o'clock, actually about 6.30 because they went to the synagogue and they got back and we were going to enjoy a, a, a Shabbat, Sabbath meal with them. And they said, Friday nights are special. It's special. We always do this. We always gather after we go read the scriptures. We come back and this is what our family does every Friday night of the world. It's interesting. They're continually to observe the Sabbath day. And that's because of the, the law of Moses and, 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 and Judaism. Well, when we continue to observe God's word, that's where we're filled with the Spirit. Are Old Testament Jews filled with the Spirit? No. He did not dwell in them. This is a New Testament principle. But it's the same type of practice where the, the baptism of the Holy Ghost is wait, wait for this to happen. It's going to happen. Power's going to come on you. And then you're going to go and be witnesses. So if anyone ever tells you or asks you, hey, if you got the Holy Ghost, you say, yeah, I got him when I got saved. No, no, I mean, have you got the baptism of the Holy Ghost? And I'll say, nope, because that was in the book of Acts, and it already happened. Well, you're missing out. Listen, I want to be filled with the Spirit. That's the instruction I see in Scripture, that God can use me however He wants, but I'm not waiting for a point in time. I want to have a continual partaking of being filled with God's Word, okay? So, that, just to again, reiterate that. Now go back to um, Acts chapter 1. So they asked him, will you restore the kingdom at this time to Israel? And pause... Israel is not the avenue that God is using at this time. And very quickly, he would remove all of them from Israel, and, and there would be no more questions about the kingdom of Israel. This is, a, this is about 33 AD. Jesus died, resurrected, they're, they're 40 days after, and they're like, is now when you're going to restore the kingdom? Just a few years 70 A.D., Jerusalem is going to be completely destroyed. I sat outside of the Western Wall, and there are huge rocks. I'm talking, I could not put my arms and measure the height or the length of them that were just thrown down from that wall, and they rebuilt the wall with smaller rocks that, uh, to, to just fill it in at a later time. When Titus went through and they burned Jerusalem, they literally threw all the rocks of that temple mount and the foundation, they threw them over the edge. They were just covered with dirt and, and they, they excavated and just leave them sitting there. Huge rocks. And the, bed, the bedrock of the, of the western wall there's a stone that they could not remove. And I literally, I put my hand on one end of it, and the preacher walked down almost 100 feet to the other end of this one stone. And it was from here to here tall. They said it might weigh between 300 and 500 metric tons. How much is that? I have no idea. It just looked like it weighed a lot. How, how they ever got it there, and the Roman um, Herod put it there. But you could see where they had tried to, to dig and chisel on that stone, and they just stopped. And there's little stones that are all over it, and that's the, the foundation of the Western Wall underground that you can't see from aerial photos. My, my, uh, my point is, the kingdom of Israel is not a thing now. When the New Testament begins... Christ is making of two one. He's making of two people one body, and it's going to be a church that God deals with, not a nation of Israel. And from 70 AD, there's no question about it. You wonder why God allowed his temple to get destroyed? No doubt why, because we'd all be worshiping it instead of worshiping him. 
That, that's what would have been happening with all those uh, uh, details, if, if I, my, my estimation. But it, it's the, the temple uh, veil was rent in two when Jesus died. We can go into the Holy of Holies. It's not hidden anymore. You can pray to God because our bodies are now the temple of the Holy Ghost. So the, the Israel says, when are we going to be restored to the kingdom? It's not for you to know. Because now you have been immersed in a new system called the church. And what do you do when, uh, when kings come in and change kingdoms? They usually destroy everything in their way. That's what they usually do. What happens when a business gets uh, bought out by another business? Do the uh, top executives keep their jobs? They're like, uh-oh, we better look for another job because somebody bought us out. They come in and they change the program to the new system. Well, that, that's exactly what happens with the New Testament. So when they ask this question, is this the time when you'll restore the, the kingdom to Israel? No, it's not. That'll be when he returns physically. And so that this, this time period in between is now the church. Verse 7, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. Does the New Testament talk about the return of Christ? It does. Do you know where it talks about the return of Christ? In the Old Testament. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You're like, no preacher, that's the New Testament. No, that's still Old Testament because Jesus has not died yet. You want to learn about the return of Christ? Read Matthew 24. Why, why would the signs, why would it not be for them to know the times and seasons? Because the church is going to get raptured and removed before the return of Christ happens. We, we are not going to be concerned about the signs of Christ's return because there's a great mystery. Uh, the Lord's going to descend from heaven. We're going to meet him in the air. Now, you can... You can look at those signs and say, wow, we've got to be close because look, those are, those are in view. And, and we, we, we get excited about that. But this message in Acts, he says, hey, restore the kingdom of Israel. That's not for you. Church, that's not for us. We're going to be removed in the clouds before Israel gets restored. Now, I'm all for Israel. I, I want to pray for the peace of Jerusalem because our, our theology is very closely hinged with that. Amen? Now, we're, we're definitely um, uh, uh, like a puzzle put, put very closely together. But he told them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. When's the kingdom of Israel going to be restored? Don't worry about it. You've got something else to worry about. Now, is Israel back in the land? Yes, I was just there. Are they going to be removed? No, they're going to stay there. So we can get excited that we're very close and um, scoffers doubting it. That's a sign. They're, they're evil, evil seducers getting worse and worse. There's some, there's some uh, uh, hints of coming, but here's what he told them in verse 8. Ye shall receive power. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So that point, not that presence where it's continually happening, that point of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, notice verse 8, come upon you, not within you. This is an external event. Ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. Now, get this picture because um, this is... This is a part of it. They are on the mountain of Mount Olives, and they're looking at Jerusalem two-thirds of a mile across a valley. Okay? Um, I don't know if that picture is up there, Will, from Sunday. Uh, the Mount of Olives. I don't know if I got it up there or not. But, uh, no, probably not. Those are other pictures. I don't think I gave you the Mount of Olives one. I'm sorry. I just had you, oh, that's a cute baby though, okay, good. Uh, the, the Mount of Olives, there's a big valley in between, and then you can see the Temple Mount. They are on this Mount of Olives, and he says, you're going to be my witnesses 
in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and everywhere. It's literally, I could see him pointing these places out. We know that they're on this mountain because of the next couple verses. But I was on that mountain Sunday morning overlooking Jerusalem, and the sun, the sun, you know, sometimes it pops to a cloud. I don't know how it does it. Uh, I don't understand all that astronomy, uh, astronomy and stuff. But literally, it was like a little sun spot of brightness just went right across the, the Temple Mount when I was looking at it. And you can just see this bright light go right across. And I'm like, oh, I got to get, I got I to gotta, I gotta record that. And I'm trying to get a picture where it just shines as it goes across. And I'm staring up on the Mount of Olives over a valley. And I'm seeing the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. So Jesus said, you're going to be witnesses in Jerusalem. That's where it's going to start. You wait here. And it did start in Jerusalem. Then you're going to go in Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth. That's, that's uh, Mechanicsburg, Ohio. Okay, they're, they're, We got them all covered. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And there he goes. He just ascends upon, up to heaven. And so this passage talks to us about power. What power would come upon them? He said, wait till you receive power. And there's some specific things that distinctively were powerful that they had in their lives when after this event takes place. Go back to the book of Mark, chapter 16, and I'll show you, and we'll look at a couple of these examples, and then we'll call it a day, okay? Oh, no, I got more time. I'm looking at the fast clock instead of the slow one. I got more time, okay? They try to trick me up here. You know that? They fast forward my clock, so on Sunday morning I'll let out and have time for Sunday school or for the other services. But on Wednesday, there's nothing afterwards. I can keep you all day long. No, I'm just teasing. Mark chapter 16. Let me be conscientious of the, of the lunch and the time and, and, and your uh, afternoon here. Mark chapter 16. Look at verse 15. <clears throat> He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. How did he say that? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. See that? that, that that's, that's described here. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Can you all say amen to that? Make sure you say amen to the second part. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Amen? amen. The, the emphasis is on believing. Don't let that confuse you. Nothing wrong with getting baptized. Everyone should who's already been saved. But you should never baptize an unbeliever. We should never baptize an unsaved person. Make sense? So that tells me that before they get in the water, they have to be saved. So water doesn't save them. Very simple answer. Acts 8 says they have to believe before they get baptized. Baptism is not what saves you. Um, at Mark 16, 16, 16 is not telling us that, that baptism saves you. Verse 17, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they shall drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Almost all of these, we have a scriptural uh, fulfillment in the book of Acts. So let's just look at these real quick. Um, first of all, in my name. Go to Acts chapter 3. This is the power that they were waiting to receive. And it didn't happen um, continually all the time. But there were points of it. And it said, these signs will follow, and this would be the sign that they had the power when the Holy Ghost came upon them. Look at Acts 3, verse, uh, verse 6. Lame man laid by the temple, verse 6. Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of... Wow, the first miracle done here um, that, that's recorded after the day of Pentecost in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth 
rise up and walk. They did it in his name. So the power that came upon them would be in the name of Jesus. Uh, that's a name that we ought to use frequently and be familiar with. That's, that's how we're saved, by the name of Jesus. So that's the, the signs and the power would have to be in his name. Tongues, go back to Acts chapter 2, verse 4. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What kind of tongues? Verse 6, they were confounded because that every man heard them speak in what? It was not a heavenly babble. It was not a heavenly language. They heard them speak in their own language. So what was tongues speaking in human languages that they originally or initially did not know? That's the miracle of tongues. If all of a sudden you can speak German, French, Spanish, Kentuckian, whatever language it is, and you couldn't do it before, that was what happened on the day of Pentecost. And there was no interpreter. Okay? So this was America. That's the power. What other power showed up? Um, go to Acts chapter 28. And there's other examples, but I'm just trying to show you the fulfillment of these things we find in scriptures. These signs will follow them that believe. And they were waiting to be the witnesses. Acts 28, look at verse number 1. And when they were escaped, and they knew that the island was called Melita, no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. Are you kidding me? If that was me, ah, it's the last piece of stick I ever pick up. Amen? Ah, you're carrying the sticks to the fire. I'm just burning them. Fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer. Well, actually they're right, aren't they? Whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire. Now, that is the most understated verse in the Bible, right? I, I, I would love to have been there. Paul, how calm was he? I don't know, but that, that, he didn't take it to the zoo. He put it in the fire, amen? He shook off the beast uh, in the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they'd looked a great while and saw no harm, they changed their mind and said, He's a God. No, he's just got a sign that he's got power from God Almighty. That's how. Now, I've heard of snake handling churches, and if you can do it, I'm all for you, brother. Uh, I'll stay in the lobby, okay? Amen. Uh, 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 snakes and mice, uh, they can be nice, but I don't want to be anywhere around either one of them. <laughs> this is a sign of those apostolic power that was upon them. And, and there were multiple healings, uh, when, even when, when they came in touch with, with Peter's handkerchief, people were healed. So Mark 16 says there's going to be these signs, and we see them being carried out in the book of Acts. What, what are they signs? You're my witness. You're my witness. Well, preacher, why don't we have them now? We have a different witness. We have a complete book that witnesses of the testimony of, of God. And they didn't have this book. They didn't have First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. So how are they going to convince people that there's a New Testament, that there's a resurrection, that there's a, a, no need for Israel? We've got a church. God says, I'm going to give you witness by bearing you some supernatural signs until that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part can be done away. You know, it's interesting how you prove things in the past today. You find writings. You find writings. In the city of David, I can't wait till I preach on that. I can't wait on that Sunday night to preach about the city of David. But they literally 
they thought they found the palace of David. And, and uh, I stood over it, and I'll tell you the story a few Sundays. But when, when they started digging, they found pottery from 3,000 years. And then there's a story in the Bible about Jeremiah getting thrown into a pit. And he's thrown into a pit because he gives Zedekiah bad news. Babylon's coming, right? And, and Zedekiah tells four people to throw him in the pit. And those four people, they found signets with their names on it in that rubble. Because back then, when you wrote a letter and you, put, you sealed the letter, you had a ring or a signet that you would put your stamp or your identity on it. They found little signets with those, some of those names that are in the Bible in that area of the palace. Because David didn't live in his palace forever. He died. And then other kings lived in that palace. And that, those names in that uh, pre-Babylonian uh, destruction, and that's when the palace of David would have been destroyed by, by Nebuchadnezzar. But they found those signets. You know how we prove things? We find stuff that has been written yeah. down. You know how you prove that you bought something at a store? <laughs> you got a receipt. I went to McDonald's this morning. Elliot had a, uh, a brace that had to be fixed on his braces. I'm telling you, when mama leaves, everything can happen wrong. You know, <laughs> it's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> the, the kids' braces are falling off. And we went there, and so he got it fixed. Well, no problem. But he said, I said, well, buddy, before you go back to school, you want a sandwich? He's like, is McDonald's serving breakfast? I'm like, I think they are. Oh, yeah, he wants a McGriddle. So we stop. Well, if he's going to get one, I mean, come on. Dad might as well get one, too. <laughs> so we go through, and I order, hey, give me two McGriddles and get him a drink. And got there, and the bag felt a little light. And I thought, wait a second. I looked in, there's only one McGriddle. Sorry, Elliot. Dad, no, no, I didn't do that. <laughs> you get yours. And, and I said, hey, I ordered two. And I said, well, let me get the receipt. I couldn't find the receipt. And I said, well, they didn't give me a receipt. Look, I, maybe, maybe they didn't order two. I want to. I'll pay for the second. So she was starting to make another. I handed my card, and I got on my phone to look online. They didn't charge me for two. So I'm glad I paid for the second. But I was looking for the written proof to prove if I bought two McGriddles or not. What's written down proves what took place. Amen? It hadn't been written down, but that's way more proof than supernatural signs that can be explained away. Have you heard some of the ridiculous explanations of the re splitting of the Red Sea? Yeah. Well, it was a very narrow area. That's the way the Jews walked across the Red Sea. Well, the walls of Jericho really didn't fall down. What happened was, well, Jesus really didn't resurrect. He just went into a coma and then he resuscitated. The, 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 the world of non-believers would try to explain everything away. I always love that Red Sea one because I think, wow, that's pretty amazing because if the Jews walked through two inches of water, he drowned all the Egyptians with the same two inches of water. That's even more amazing, right? But it happened the way God said, but miracles and signs, people can explain away with a lot of other things. Amen? Votes in 2020. All kinds of things. People can explain, hey, battles. I looked up because I heard when I was over there some of the, uh, some of the uh, uh, beginnings of Islam and that there was a treaty that Muhammad broke with Mecca. Uh, in the origins of Islam, he went away and he came back and he tried to conquer it and then he couldn't and he made a peace treaty and then he broke the treaty. Well, you know what? You can read just as many websites that say, no, he didn't break that treaty. They attacked him. He was righteous. How do you know? Somebody had to wrote it down because whatever bias you are can change the, the narrative. Same with these signs. But what happens is we've got Bible now dating back within 100 years of the first original copies. You have extant manuscripts to prove this New Testament. And you know what they found in Israel after they founded Israel? Dead Sea Scrolls, which connects the Old Testament with copies, and they're just the same thing. Isaiah 53 reads just like your King James Bible does. And in, in the, the cop, there's a copper scroll, all kinds of, of artifacts. It's written down. So God wrote it down. 
Before he wrote it down, he gave these signs as witness. But the greatest witness is a written receipt. It's the greatest witness, a written receipt. You know, we, we used to say pictures would prove things. Have you heard of artificial intelligence now? Hey, I'm going to get hair one of these days from an AI picture. It's going to happen, man. I'm going to figure that out, and my picture is going to be looking good. I'm going to artificially engineer some hair on this head, at least in pictures. And uh, You can't even trust that, can you? You can't trust photos. Written things. Written. And so in the book of Acts, just where we're at, is God gave them power. Mark tells us some of the signs until we have the, the what's written down. Go back to Acts chapter 1, and I'll just give you one, more, one or two more thoughts, and we'll be done for the day. Acts chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. You're going to receive power. You're going to be witnesses. When he had spoken these things, he was taken up from a cloud. Verse 10, while they... Look steadfastly toward heaven. He went up. Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, You men of Galilee, why stand you gazing in heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from you in heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. The power, the plan, go into all the world, the promise, he's coming back. He is coming back. What, do you really think it's going to happen? I believe he kept all the other promises. So uh, I believe this one's going to happen too. The power, the plan, the promise, and then look at the perspective. Verse number 12, and we'll finish. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. There was a set amount of, of space that they were allowed to travel that would not be considered work. If you went over that, it would be considered work. Now, obviously, that can change now that you have vehicles. I don't know what a Sabbath day's journey is in today's Judaism, but reading tells me that a Sabbath day's journey is about two-thirds of a mile. Can I just tell you, on the Mount of Olives, overlooking the Kidron Valley, it's not a mile from there to Jerusalem. It's just across the valley, and that was where he said, go back and wait. You can go there on today. You can get there from this, in the perspective, wow, I, uh, just seeing all those, those hills and valleys now, uh, when, I, when I'm reading the Bible, uh, it, it just, I have a different perspective. Do you have to go there to see the things, I'm going to tell you again and again, no, you need to read this to believe it. But their perspective was, we're supposed to go wait, and we have uh, this much space to go and, and, and I don't think it was telling them that they couldn't travel more on the Sabbath day. It's just describing it in terms that Luke would, that um, uh, Theophilus would understand. Luke said, it's a Sabbath day's journey to go back to Jerusalem and to wait for the promise. Okay? So the power, the plan, the promise, and the perspective. Um, boy, there's uh, uh, just a, a lot of, of things that... Um, we can add into our understanding of Acts if we just go through it verse by verse. So it's what we're trying to do and study it together. That's every every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for your presence. I thank you for an opportunity to bow in front of you, open your wo- your word, and submit to you. And Lord, I pray that we would um, be students of the book, people of the book, as. Uh, uh, what our, uh, 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 our, our friends in Israel were, were labeled and called, 